Okay, well, uh, my name is Aradna Tripathi. I'm an assistant professor at UCLA. And I'd like to uh, first just begin by thanking the conference organizers for making this such a stimulating meeting so far and for having all of us out here. Now, what I'm going to do today is talk about what we've learned about the geologic record of climate change for the last roughly two and a half million years using some recently developed tracers. What I hope to show you is that it's actually an incredibly exciting time to be an earth historian or a paleoclimatologist. And uh, this is in part because our field is going through an intellectual period of growth that's not unlike that of the gut microbiome or planetary science. And this is really being enabled by the development of new technologies that are allowing us to discover Earth's history in a way that we haven't before. Really, we have, through a set of new chemical tracers, these clear windows into past climate change that allow us to hypothesis test in ways we haven't been able to. All right, so just to give you a roadmap for the talk today, I'm going to begin by giving you an overview of how we do what we do. I'll talk a little bit about the different types of archives that we have to study Pleistocene to Holocene climate change. Pleistocene is the time interval, the epoch, that spans from about 2.6 million years ago to 11,000 years ago, and the Holocene spans the last 11,000 years. I'll go into the different types of tools that we use, and mainly really just to give you a sense of the assumptions that go into our reconstructions of climate change. I'll talk about some of the main features of the climate record from what we know about glacial interglacial cycles or these swings between extrema that occurred in the Pleistocene roughly every 41,000 to 100,000 years. I'll talk about the discovery of abrupt climate events, really events that occur on timescales that matter to us. So abrupt coolings and abrupt warmings that can take place on a timescale of say five years to 20 years. And then I'll talk about some of the work that my group has been doing, looking at the climate of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago. But before I do any of that, I actually just want to give you a quick introduction to what we actually do at my group at UCLA, since it's a chance to get to know all of you. And I want to highlight that uh, we're really working on developing a new set of geochemical tracers for past temperature that are based on looking at the occurrence of of heavy isotopes in molecules. So this is a pretty exciting new frontier in what's termed stable isotope geochemistry. And so we're using computational methods to really explore what controls this heavy isotope pairing in molecules, and then also doing a lot of methods calibration, so just to see how our theoretical knowledge can be translated into the different types of archives that we might use as geoscientists. And then we also are very interested in, in developing environmental reconstructions of past temperature on land, as well as oceanographic reconstructions, and using these reconstructions to really probe the dynamics of hothouse periods or greenhouse periods in Earth's history, as well as icehouse periods like the Pleistocene. And so this is just part of what we do, but uh, it certainly is the largest part of what we do involves looking at climate change. Okay, so the archives that we use as geoscientists for reconstructing Earth's climate really are quite varied. Now, what I show here is the geologic time scale going back nearly the whole four and a half billion years of Earth's history. And you can see here where the Pleistocene and Holocene are. Now, a really remarkable thing about the Pleistocene and Holocene is that we can actually reconstruct climates in using a range of different types of archives. We can look at polar climate change using ice cores, the oldest ice we have on the planet is not much more than a million years old, so this is really about as far back as we'll be able to go. We can also look at ice cores in the tropics, from say tropical glaciers in the Andes or in Papua New Guinea. We can also look at uh, glaciers that occur in mountain ranges such as the Himalaya to look at regional expressions of climate change. We also can get records that go slightly further back in time that are recovered from different ocean basins. And these ocean basins represent large bathtubs that accumulate windblown dust. They accumulate the remains of different types of microorganisms and macroorganisms that live in the water column. And they pretty much continuously archive these rem remnants. So they're really beautiful 
archives because they represent near continuous records of past climate change. Unfortunately, because of plate tectonics, actually, which destroys ocean crust that's older than about 200 million years old, we can't go back much further than the last 200 million years. So further back in, further back in time, we're really uh, reliant on looking at sediments that are found on land that give us kind of discontinuous pictures into climate variability. Now that being said, for the Pleistocene and Holocene, we can look at all three of these types of archives and specifically the compounds that they contain. In the case of ice cores, we can look at gas bubbles, we can look at mineral dust, and we can actually look at the water that comprises the ice itself. And all of these can tell us something about the environment that they formed in. On land, we can actually look at um, pretty exciting archives which represent, in some sense, frozen groundwater. So we can look at cave deposits and soils when it comes to looking at, at the Pleistocene and Holocene. And the exciting thing about some of these, particularly cave deposits, is that we have the ability to look at seasonal scale climate variability. Seasonal scale climate variability, say 20,000 years ago or a million years ago, is pretty remarkable. And that's really one of the frontiers in Pleistocene paleoclimate. Now another frontier actually involves work that people here like Beth Shapiro are doing, where they're really looking at molecular fossils that are present in sediments, uh, as well as you know, the more traditional paleobiology that's done looking at traditional fossils that also allow us to reconstruct environmental conditions. I want to highlight that actually to do this type of work, it's typically actually quite a large team effort. The environments that we have to work in are ones that actually can be quite challenging. For example, if we go to the polar regions to recover ice cores, and so these really are international efforts. We also have been recovering sediments from ocean basins for roughly the last 60 or so years, and this has also been due to international efforts through programs like the Ocean Drilling Program, which have been punching holes in the seabed for about this length of time, and uh, recovering sediments such as these. Similar types of programs that um, occur in present-day lake basins, and then we can sample ancient lake basins such as what's shown here, which these are the remnants of the predecessor to the Great Salt Lake in Utah. And you can see these ancient shorelines, which can be actually followed quite continuously. You can see one of my graduate students out in the field sampling materials from one of these ancient shorelines. And so what we can then do once we've actually recovered these samples is actually measure a whole range of tracers and really the field of quantitative paleoclimatology is what's emerged in the last 20 or so years, facilitated by the development of technologies such as mass spectrometers that are high enough in precision to enable us to do some pretty, pretty cool science. Now, we can look at gases, we can look at minerals, we can look at organic compounds. In all of these cases, look at different chemical variables to try to constrain various environmental or ecological variables that might be of interest. In all of these cases, we're looking at ancient samples, and so our ability to infer ancient variability is really predicated on our understanding of the modern. And I give you an example here for shells of these small protists that are mineralized that we find in ocean sediments. And it's been well documented for different species of tropical and subtropical fulminifera of this type that their magnesium content is correlated with environmental temperatures. Now, this is kind of one example of a, a proxy uh, or an indirect tracer that works fairly well. But often, actually, what we find is that most of our proxies are controlled by multiple variables. And so the limitations in our approaches are often subject to our understanding of modern systems, or they're subject to large systematic errors simply because of the fact that these are multivariate systems. So there are, in some sense, there are Gordian knots that we have to try to unravel and we often cannot with the types of proxies that we're using. And so really another new frontier in the field of quantitative paleoclimatology is associated with the development of new techniques as well as enhancing our understanding of the modern systematics. Now what we then do in terms of developing our climate records is we take the measurement of some proxy and we have some unit of time that's associated with it. So and if this in of itself is actually a whole field uh, of, of, kind of quantitative geochronology that's principally dependent on the measurement of, of radioisotopes. And actually, as mass spectrometers become more and more sensitive, we're suddenly able to look at the timing of climate change and, and
the sequencing of different types of climate changes with a much higher degree of certainty than before. And so this represents really another example of a new frontier in Pleistocene and Holocene paleoclimate. Now, just to kind of summarize, some of the new frontiers that we have then include looking at sample recoveries from new regions. Actually, it was only uh, about uh, nine years ago that we had the first kind of paleoclimate mission to the Arctic Ocean. I call it the equivalent of a, a paleoclimate mission to the moon when I'm teaching. But actually, we've been to the moon more than we've actually been to core in the central Arctic Ocean. And we've only been that one time. We've not been able to go back since. And so what we're going to see in the decades to come are really the development of new understanding of his the history of critically important regions such as this just due to the recovery of new samples from these areas. Now I mentioned also that we have materials such as speleothems, these cave deposits that can accumulate quite rapidly and these really allow us to develop records to look at timescales that matter to humans. In the post-recession today I saw quite an extraordinary uh, poster by a Korean colleague who was looking at records of paleoceanographic variability for the last two million years where every sample was taken in 10 years apart. That's a really, really remarkable window into past climate variability. We also have the development of microanalytical tools that allow us to, say from something like a cave deposit, sputter off the surface molecule by molecule and this really also allows us to push the limits in terms of the temporal resolution of our records. And then finally, there's also, of course, the development of more precise chronologies and new chemical tracers that let us resolve different variables subject to different errors in the tools that we have. And these are turning out to be quite illuminating. So what do we then think we know about the Pleistocene compared to other time intervals in Earth's history. Well, if we go pretty far back in Earth's history, we know that due to changes in incoming solar radiation, as well as greenhouse gas levels, that the Earth's radiative budget was considerably different. So we can look at time periods, say, prior to 500 million years ago, and we see that there were times where the oceans nearly froze all the way to the tropics. All right, and so these are hypothesized snowball or slush ball earths, depending on whether you think there were significant oases present in the oceans. We can then move forward in Earth's history closer to present, and what we see is that just after the fall of the dinosaurs, early in the age of the mammals, there are periods like the early Eocene, roughly 50 million years ago. The polar regions were characterized by vast fossil forests, despite there being darkness present still for six months of the year. And so this is explained by actually having a similar incoming solar insulation, but substantially higher greenhouse gas levels. And then we can look at kind of ice house climates, such as what characterized the Pleistocene, and we see that these are time periods where insulation or solar radiation is similar. Greenhouse gas levels were fairly similar to present. The configuration of the continents was very similar to present, as were ocean currents. And we can see that the climates were a bit different, although not as extreme as either of these. And so, from this, we can kind of develop a picture then of how Earth's climate has evolved over, over through time. Now, I want to next kind of show you what we know about the nature of climate variability in the Pleistocene. And I'm just going to focus first on the last 800,000 years. So it's shown here, going from present day to 800,000 years ago, are records from the Antarctic ice core. These have been reproduced. Um, for much of the record from multiple cores. And you can see CO2 levels going through time here and methane levels on the bottom panel. The middle panel is based on oxygen isotope records of the ice and this has been converted to a temperature scale over here. And there's something quite remarkable that you see from this, right? There's this systematic sawtooth pattern that's observed in all of the records. So this is really one of the iconic sets of records that the field of paleoclimate has generated in the last 20 years. And what they show is a richness of variability in the climate system. We see that there clearly are glacial intervals, and these all appear to have CO2 levels of about 180 parts per million. And these are times where actually temperatures were quite cold also in the Antarctic. We see that there are short-lived interglacials that are characterized by high CO2. And so here are some of the distinct kind of definitions of those two types of periods. We can also see that the variability between glacials and interglacials uh, takes place on timescales of about 100,000 years. 
And it's been demonstrated by looking at the phasing of these events in concert with climate models that actually these are paced by changes in the eccentricity of Earth's orbit around the sun. Prior to this time, we actually have evidence for a 41,000 year glacial interglacial cycle that's been shown from not ice core records, but indirect chemical records of, of climate of the type that I generate from ocean sediments. And we can see more of a 41,000 year signature in these. There's also something else that about these records. You can see that there's evidence for these abrupt changes. Now, some of these are termed stadials or interstadials, depending on roughly how long they last. And there are even more abrupt events that have been linked to both ecosystem and societal changes that are quite dramatic um, in their nature. Now, I want to highlight that when we take a look at these abrupt events, both the abrupt events that we see and if that are abrupt warmings, as well as the abrupt coolings, occur on very, very rapid timescales. Some cases less than 30 years, sometimes even as short as five years. Now what's shown here is in this proxy for temperature, the auction isotope record of ice cores. In this case, the, the uh, timescale's reversed. There's present day, it's going back through time. And you can actually see the Greenland records here indicating abrupt shifts in the air temperature above where this Greenland ice core was taken. And here's really where you see a whole bunch of these abrupt events. Now what's also shown are two different sets of ice cores from Antarctica. That's the black and blue records. And what's really remarkable is that they don't show this behavior. And so the mechanisms actually underlying this is going to be the focus of Ann's talk later in today's session. I do want to highlight that the abruptness of these events is not limited to Greenland. What's really remarkable is that we see them in records of sea surface temperatures over here that actually go back through time. You can see this is overlain with a Greenland record and they match up nearly one to one. Now they're not just seen in the subtropical North Atlantic, but we can see them in records from near Venezuela, records off of California, and you can also see these events even in records from right near here in Korea. Okay, so in records, for example, from, from southern and eastern China. Now, what's particularly concerning about some of these abrupt events, such as this event here that's labeled the Younger Dryas, that took place about 12,000 years ago, is, that's observed in Greenland, is that we also observe evidence for abrupt changes in the outflow of major rivers. Now, so far, this has been documented in two different systems. We've seen it in West Africa, and we've seen it in the Amazon River, where we've taken sediment cores from near the freshwater plume and looked at the chemistry of these marine plankton. And so it's just shown here as a record of, or a reconstruction of sea surface salinity. Going back from the last glacial maximum, you see this abrupt shift here and this abrupt shift back up again. And so this points towards pretty dramatic changes in terrestrial water cycle. I want to highlight that there's an, of another alarming recent finding that we've had, which is that when we look at reconstructions of temperature, places like the Western Tropical Pacific, we see that they change also in concert with changes in CO2. So here's a record of CO2 going black for glacial interglacial cycles, and then a reconstruction of sea surface temperatures for this site. Now what's particularly interesting is some work that we've done where we've just looked at what the kind of uh, maxima and minima of temperatures are if we look at the last ice age versus the present day. And what's interesting is that that change in temperature that we're reconstructing using some thermodynamically based tracers is significantly greater than what most uh, previous workers had suggested using non-thermodynamically based tracers. It's also significantly larger than what most climate models have shown. And so this subject of kind of the CO2 temperature relationship through time is really going to be discussed in depth by Sean Marcotte later in this session. So I just want to wrap up by kind of talking about records of environmental change a little bit closer to where we are at present. And so I'll show some records that, I'll show a record that comes from central China from this uh, area called the Lus Plateau near Xi'an, where we actually have these extensive wind-blown dust deposits. And we take a look at records of temperature change from this region, also using this thermodynamically based tracer. It's the temperature change in degrees centigrade. What we see is that most climate models actually produce a pretty broad range of results. These are the state-of-the-art climate models that are used for projections of future climate change. And if we say, let's hindcast what the climate of the last ice age looks like and compare it to some of the 
data sets that we've been developing, we can see that most models are actually not even in the right ballpark. There are only a few that do a decent job at it, and the ones that are doing a decent job are the ones that actually simulate changes in the, the jet. So, and if with this, I want to kind of leave you with a provocative thought, which is that right now what we do when we forecast climate change in the years to come, we actually take the approach of using a multi-model average. We say, let's assume that we are working in a, in a, a system where we can you know, uh, use a, a model democracy. We, use, we assume one climate model has one vote, and we take the average of all of them. Now, can we actually move past this approach? In some sense, this makes the assumption that there are systematic